Good morning. This, this hearing will now come to order. As this is a virtual hearing, we must address a few housekeeping matters. For today's meeting, the chair or staff designated by the chair may mute participants' microphones while they are not under recognition for the purposes of eliminated, eliminating inadvertent background noise. Members are responsible for muting and unmuting themselves. If you notice you are recognized, if I notice that you are recognized and that you have not unmuted yourself, I will ask the staff to send you a request to unmute yourself. Please then accept that request so you're no longer muted. I remind all members and witnesses that the five minute clock still applies. If there's a technology issue, we will move to the next member until the issue is resolved and you will retain the balance of your time. You will notice a clock on your screen that will show how much time is remaining. At one minute remaining, the clock will turn to yellow. At 30 seconds remaining, I will gently tap the gavel to remind members that their time is almost expired. When your time is expired, the clock will turn to red and I will begin to recognize the next member. In terms of the speaking order, we will follow the order set forth in the House rules, beginning with the chair and ranking member, then members' presence at the time the hearing is called to order will be recognized in order of seniority, and finally, members not present at the time the hearing is called to order. Finally, House rules require me to remind you that we have set up an email address to which members can send anything they wish to submit in writing at any of our hearings or markups. That email address has been provided in advance to your staff. Okay, we can go ahead. Today, the Interior Environment Subcommittee will examine the President's fiscal year 2023 budget request for the Environmental Protection Agency. Joining with us this morning is EPA Administrator Michael Reagan. With him is Chief Financial Officer Faisal Amin. It is good to see you again, Mr. Administrator, and welcome, Mr. Amin. Before you start, I want to personally thank both of you for your partnership in completing the fiscal year 2022 bill, and I look forward to working with you again as we begin our work on the fiscal year 2023 bill. Administrator Reagan, I also want to thank you so much for your visit to SACO a couple of months ago. I appreciated your insight and commitment to help not just with our PFAS issues in Maine, but across the country. For fiscal year 2023, the President is requesting $11.9 billion for the EPA a $2.3 billion increase over the enacted level. In addition to this request, the EPA has released its strategic plan with seven clear and ambitious goals. For the first time, this plan includes a goal focused solely on addressing climate change. This also includes an unprecedented goal to advance environmental justice and civil rights. I applaud you for taking on these two critical issues and look forward to supporting you in these efforts. During this hearing, I hope that we can explore further how this request will support your strategic plan and primary mission to protect human health and the environment. Some highlights of the budget request include increasing staffing after years of decline to its highest levels in over a decade, tackling the climate crisis head on through robust funding for the EPA science and technology and environment programs taking decisive action to address environmental justice and civil rights so that we can finally make significant strides in communities that have been historically underserved and overburdened, and building on the funding provided in the American Rescue Plan and the Infrastructure Investment and Jobs Act to fix our nation's crumbling infrastructure and to address public health challenges that we currently face. I firmly believe the EPA's mission is achievable when it is fully resourced and staff. That is why our fiscal year 2022 bill provided the EPA with the second largest increase to its budget in over a decade. We also funded environmental justice at $100 million, which is the largest increase the program has seen in its 50 year history. The president's request builds on the success of our fiscal year 2022 bill and I look forward to collaborating closely with the administrator and President Biden in achieving our shared vision for a safer, more prosperous, and more just nation. I'd now like to yield to my friend, the ranking member of the subcommittee, Mr. Joyce, for any opening remarks he would like to make. Thank you for yielding, Madam Chair. Uh, I appreciate today's opportunity to discuss the Environmental Protection Agency's fiscal year 2023 budget proposal. Welcome back, Administrator Reagan. Thanks to you and Mr. Amin for joining us this morning. Mr. Amin, I believe this is your first time appearing before the subcommittee in this capacity, so congratulations on your appointment and welcome. Mr. Reagan, your stewardship of the EPA is important, and we value the work you and your staff do day in and day out to keep our air, land, and water clean. I also appreciate that you made a point to travel around the country 
including in my home state of Ohio, to see how states and tribes rely on EPA funding to manage core environmental programs, make critical infrastructure upgrades, and protect their natural resources. When you appeared before us last year, I raised the importance of reining in our federal spending following the pandemic. Regrettably, the administration's FY23 budget is a substantial departure from the bipartisan funding agreement Congress passed last month. For EPA, this request includes an additional $2.3 billion and seeks to add well over 1,000 new federal employees. Notably, the budget proposes nearly $650 million more than the administration's request last year. We seem to be moving in the wrong direction, Administrator. Right now, inflation is at a 40-year high. Gas prices are skyrocketing, and Americans across the country are struggling to pay their bills. To create a vibrant economy today, and for our kids and grandkids, Congress, and this committee in particular, cannot entertain unrealistic spending levels. We have a duty to the taxpayer to work within spending constraints, and <clears throat> implement physically responsible policies, and ensure that every dollar we provide to the EPA helps you meet your mission. To that point, I was pleased to see the EPA request focuses on providing funds to ensure clean and safe water for our nation's citizens, support much needed infrastructure uh, <clears throat> improvements, revitalize contaminated areas through the Brownfields program, and to partner with states, tribes, and local stakeholders to address environmental and public health threats. Notably, these programs make substantial differences in communities without the use of a top-down, heavy-handed regulations. Unfortunately, these core investments are overshadowed by the agency's emphasis on extraordinary funding levels to write regulations, hire more lawyers, push unrealistic climate goals, and carry out a, re a robust enforcement agenda. I plan to work with the chair to ensure the programs that have significant impact in states and localities, like Superfund cleanup programs, rural water technical assistance grants, and regional water programs receive the attention and increases they deserve. Restoring geo uh, <clears throat> geographic program dollars, like those provided through the Great Lakes Restoration Initiative, are essential to protecting some of our nation's most valuable resources. I know firsthand that now is not the time to take our foot off the gas, especially when it comes to protecting the lakes. Building the GLRI investment from FY22 is vital to ensuring that the Great Lakes, which provide clean drinking water to 48 million Americans, support more than one and a half million jobs, and generate over $62 billion a year in wages, are safeguarded from longstanding threats like harmful algal blooms, water pollution, invasive species, and coastal erosion. I have no doubt that we will also have a robust policy discussion given was played out on the world stage. With the conflicting conflict raging in Ukraine and the steep prices we receive at the gas pump, it is now more important than ever we continue to promote an all of the above domestic energy strategy. Utilizing all of our domestic resources to increase production brings stability to the marketplace, reduces energy costs, spurs economic growth, and creates good paying jobs. More than that, it puts America on a path to energy independence, which is imperative to our national security. I'm concerned, though, that this administration is pursuing an agenda that, simply put, undermines the American energy sector and fails to put American industries first and businesses first. Rather than imposing burdensome and costly regulations, EPA and its federal partners should be collaborating with the energy sector to leverage free market solutions, spur innovation, and enhance emission reduction technology to unleash energy production here at home. If not, we and our allies will be forced to turn to foreign countries to meet our energy needs. I look forward to having a constructive conversation about how the FY23 budget can support, rather than sideline, American energy. I also look forward to understanding how the agency is implementing common sense, cost-effective rulemakings that help us protect the environment while providing regulatory certainty to a certain small businesses, farmers, and ranchers. We've all struggled the last couple of years, and I want to ensure the EPA is doing its part to boost, not burden, all sectors of the economy. Thank you again for joining us this morning. Uh, Administrator Reagan, and the FY2, uh, 23 process moves forward. I look forward to working with the chair to provide the EPA with the necessary resources to meet its mission to protect the American people and our environment. Thank you, Chair Reagan. I yield back. Thank you so much for your statement. Mr. Reagan, we would love to hear from you now. Thank you very much for joining us this morning. Well, thank you, Chairwoman Pingree and Ranking Member Joyce and members of the committee. You know, I really appreciate the opportunity to appear before you today to discuss the bold vision laid out in the US EPA's proposed fiscal year 2023 budget. In this budget request, we lay out an ambitious and transformative plan for the EPA with the goal of a healthier, more prosperous nation where all people have equal access to clean air, clean water, and healthy communities. 
President Biden's proposed FY 2023 budget request for EPA provides $11.9 billion to advance key priorities, tackling the climate crisis, delivering environmental justice and equity for everyone, protecting air quality, upgrading the nation's aging water infrastructure, revitalizing our nation's magnificent water bodies, and rebuilding core functions at EPA to keep pace with the growing economy. Over the last year, we've made important progress towards many of these goals. And I'm proud of the foundations we've laid in partnerships that have underpinned our successes. But there's still so much more work to do to ensure that all children have safe, healthy places to live, learn, and play, to build a stronger, more sustainable economy, and to advance American innovation and ingenuity in ways we haven't seen. Put simply, investing in EPA is an investment in the health and the well being of all of the communities we serve. It's also an investment in the economic vitality of our nation. I've had the privilege to visit many communities in your states and see firsthand the environmental and public health challenges that many of your constituents continue to experience, from unprecedented flooding experiences to crumbling water infrastructure. I've spoken with mothers whose children have been lead poisoned. I've met with people who are living in tox with toxic waste in their backyards, and I've seen conditions that are simply unacceptable in the United States of America. From investing in our nation's climate resilience to cleaning up contaminated land, there is no shortage of critical work that needs to be done. Members of the committee, EPA is up to the task and we are ready to partner with you. We're eager to work with all of you to deliver for our fellow Americans and to secure our nation's global competitiveness. But we need your support. Both the urgency and economic opportunity presented by the climate change crisis require that we leave no stone unturned. The FY 2023 budget invests $773 million towards tackling the climate crisis and reaping the benefits that come with that. Healthier communities, good paying jobs, and increased energy security. The communities hit hardest by pollution and climate change are most often communities of color, indigenous communities, our rural communities, and economically disadvantaged communities. For generations, many of these vulnerable communities have been overburdened with higher instances of pollution in their air, water, and land. This inequity of environmental protection is not just an environmental justice issue, but it's also a civil rights concern. In the FY 2023 budget, EPA will expand upon the historic investments made, by, made in environmental justice and civil rights to reduce the historically disproportionate health impacts of pollution in communities with environmental justice concerns. Across the budget, EPA is investing more than $1.4 billion to advance environmental justice, clean up legacy pollution, and create good paying jobs in the process in those communities. Across the country, poor air quality affects millions of people, perpetuating harmful health and economic impacts. For the FY 2023 budget, the agency will protect our air quality by cutting emissions of ozone forming pollutants, particulate matter, and air toxics. The president's budget also includes $1.1 billion to improve air quality and set standards that reduce pollution from mobile and stationary sources. A thriving economy also requires clean and safe water for all. Although progress has been made, many still lack access to healthy water, face in, in inadequate wastewater infrastructure, and suffer from the effects of lead pipes. America's water system, systems are also facing new challenges, including cybersecurity threat, climate change, and emerging contaminants like PFAS. The FY 2023 budget positions EPA to create durable environmental policy that sets our nation on a path to win the 21st century. It will allow us to meet the pressing needs faced by millions of Americans and fundamentally improves people's lives for the better. Thank you for the opportunity to be here today and offer this testimony. And I look forward to our continued partnership and I look forward to the conversation that we're gonna to have today. Thank you so much for your uh, opening remarks and, and thank you for your service. We're looking forward to, to dis discussing many topics uh, with you today. Uh, I'm gonna start the questions myself and uh, just wanna dive right into something that's critically important to my state. Um, I mentioned before that you were kind enough to come and visit us in the state of Maine, and um, you joined with me in a really challenging meeting talking to people um, who are dealing with the front lines of the crisis around PFAS contamination, particularly in agricultural land in our state, but also in drinking water and beyond. 
Um, this is a growing environmental crisis for us, and I imagine this is going on in many other states, but perhaps is undetected. Um, we continue to learn more about these chemicals health effects and more Americans are becoming deeply concerned that their families could be at serious risk. Along with the billions provided in the Infrastructure Investment and Jobs Act, this subcommittee has provided significant resources to address PFAS. I was pleased to see that the budget request builds on this funding and continues a strong focus on PFAS research and regulatory action. Can you talk about that a little bit, give us some more insight into the EPA's current and future work on this very complicated set of chemicals, um, and also uh, give us some ideas of how that work ties into the agency's PFAS strategic roadmap? Absolutely. And, and first and foremost, Chair Pingree, thank you for inviting me to your district to have that important conversation. I think my decisions have been shaped by my personal experiences as a secretary in North Carolina dealing with the PFAS crisis. And the roundtable that you and I had and the, the roundtables that I've held really are informing this sense of urgency around these forever chemicals. Uh, so we're taking action. Uh, in October of last year, I announced a PFAS a strategic roadmap, which lays out an all of the above uh, comprehensive approach across all of EPA's media offices. Uh, since I've announced that group, um, we've taken action. Uh, we started a rulemaking designating P4 and PFAS as a hazardous substance under the Superfund law. Uh, we're developing a national PFAS testing strategy under TSCA to deepen our understanding of the impacts of categories of PFAS uh, including potential hazards to both our health, but also our environment. We've also started a rulemaking to establish a, a national primary drinking water regulation for P4 and PFAS that would set enforceable limits. limits. And, and finally, we finalized a rule to undertake uh, nationwide monitoring of PFAS in our drinking water. I think it's important for me to also say that we understand that the conditions on the ground differ in the states and that we serve an important role, role in setting a health baseline and a better understanding. But a majority of the resources that EPA receives in our budget is passed through to the states so that they can develop specific strategies on the ground that are most protective to their communities. So I would hate for anyone to walk away and look at these budget requests as EPA inflating itself or growing tremendously a good portion of these resources go to our state partners who know their communities better than we ever could. Yeah, thank you so much for emphasizing that because I do think that's a, a really critical point. And I know our states um, greatly benefit and really appreciate uh, the, the way the funding is structured so that they can make the decisions for their own states about the most critical issues. Um, I will uh, yield back my time and uh, happy to recognize the ranking member for his questions. Thank you very much, uh, Madam Chair. Administrator Reagan, I'm supportive, as I'm sure you are, of advancing domestic recycling efforts, especially for metal, given the environmental and economic benefits. Recycling scrap metal helps reduce pollution, limit waste, and reuse materials. Does the EPA support scrap metal recycling, and is the agency supportive of advancements in metal recycling technology applications, more specifically, metal shredder plants? You know, we definitely uh, embrace recycling and we actually have invested a lot more time and resources um, to, to support and focus on recycling within this administration. And so we recognize that if we can create some closed loop systems in our economy that we can protect against having to mine for precious metals any more than we have to, we can also create efficiencies in our economy. So yes, recycling is a, is a top of mind issue for this agency and we're investing the resources in it to ensure that we understand how we can tackle these problems. But does the EPA understand the necessity of metal shredding plants with respect to infrastructure, both as a processor of obsolete infrastructure uh, like bridges, roads, et cetera, as a provider of raw materials to steel mills and foundries? We absolutely do. And that's why recovering as much material and reducing as much waste as possible uh, is a key part of the way we are looking at and not only improving our economy, but also improving, as you say, and strengthening our infrastructure. Well, if vehicle and appliance shredding plants, including plants that use the latest pollution controls, are prohibited from operating, what does EPA believe will happen to the roughly 15 million vehicles 
that reach the end of their life annually. Also, where will the steel industry uh, source the raw materials it needs to continue production and meet demand? The only alternatives I'm aware of are more mining or cycling or sourcing recycled steel from foreign countries like China. In your opinion, are those desirable solutions? I think the desirable solutions are for the opportunities to let uh, recycling facilities uh, work to their potential to continue to increase again in economic development and jobs and contributing to uh, our, our modern infrastructure. Obviously, any of these facilities, whether it be recycling or whether it be a petrochemical plant or any plant, we believe should be properly placed in any kind of situation where there aren't disproportionate impacts to any communities, especially communities that are already disproportionately impacted by other facilities and operations. And so, yes, there is a role for recycling facilities. We firmly support that. Uh, but those facilities have to be put in a place where they don't exacerbate or create hazard and harm. So I take it from your answer, then you're willing to work with metal recycling industry given their contribution to the administration's infrastructure and circular economy goals. I think this agency has done that. I think we've worked with recycling facilities all around the country. Um, I think that you know it's our job to be sure that we balance uh, environmental protection, public health protection, and economic prosperity. And we are working hard to do that as really good partners and honest brokers in that situation. Well, I recognize that environmental justice is a key priority for the administration and your agency. I also recognize the importance of balancing economic justice with beneficial economic and environmental opportunities in these impacted communities. For this administration, are environmental justice concerns always going to take precedence over the established zoning policies in most major cities which seek to locate businesses in proximity to others of similar nature? You know, our goal is to really partner with our governors, our state secretaries and, and uh, secretaries of health and environment and our locally elected officials. Uh, it's my goal to work uh, as the administrator to provide technical support and resources so that communities, uh, mayors, uh, county commissioners, economic developers, state secretaries can make the best decisions that they believe are appropriate for their communities. Uh, we've done a good job of that, and I hope that we can continue to do that. I want to be able to provide the technical assistance and resources to locally elected officials so that they can make the best decisions for their constituents. Well, in what cases should the longstanding industrial nature of certain urban areas be taken into account on equal footing with residential uses that arose later in these areas? You know, I think it's, it's a, 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 an opportunity for us to really take a look at how we invest in our economy and the growth of businesses uh, without it being at the expense of any one community. Uh, it, my, my, my attitude towards this is that there are lots of ample opportunities for job growth and economic development, but it doesn't have to come at the expense of any one community. So where we see disproportionate impact, predatory uh, behavior, uh, we, we look at the sound science, we look at the facts, we look at the impacts on humans, and then we can govern ourselves accordingly. Uh, there are lots of ways we can situate facilities in this country so that we can be globally competitive. And we want to be a partner with the business community to choose the right places to do that. Uh, thank you. I appreciate your time. And uh, Madam Chair, I yield back with well, no time I have left. Thank you. <laughs> thank you. You can always have all the time you ever want. So, uh, Mr. Harder, you're next for questions. Well, thank you so much, Chair Pingree, and, and thank you, Amb Administrator Regan, for being here uh, today. I look forward to discussing how we can keep toxic chemicals out of our community drinking water systems. In, in my district, in the California Central Valley, the city of Manteca is dealing with an ongoing contamination of the carcinogenic, carso, carcinogenic uh, 123 uh, trichloropropane, known as, as TCP, in its public water system. Uh, in Manteca, the, the TCP water contamination was caused by the soil fumigants manufactured by Shell Oil Company and Dow Chemical Company. Uh, California currently regulates TCP because it causes cancer, uh, but the EPA has failed to regulate it on its primary drinking water contaminant list. Uh, for decades, the EPA has declined to seriously regulate uh, TCP. Uh, with the EPA's budget of over $2.8 billion for clean drinking water, uh, why has the EPA failed to act on regulating and removing TCP from vulnerable public water systems like the one in Manteca? You know, I think we're taking a very strong look at all of the threats to our, our drinking water, whether they be some of the traditional contaminants that you've raised or some of the new emerging contaminants. It's no secret that this agency 
uh, was underfunded during the last administration. And quite frankly, funding has been low for a number of years. So we are really seeking the resources that we're asking for, for a reason. And that is so that we can do more and so that we can move faster. Uh, our scientists are ready. Uh, our programs are ready to take aggressive action to do the proper analytics required to protect public health. And unfortunately, we have had to rely a lot on state leadership because traditionally this agency hasn't had the resources to do the technical analysis that we need to move as quickly on all the rules that people uh, have raised to us. And so I will take this back to my team to take a look at where this regulation fit in terms of our analysis. But we have a lot of challenging issues before us. And that's why we're asking for these resources, these precious resources, so that EPA can be on equal footing to protect our public. Administrator, the, the March 2021 final regulatory determinations for the fourth drinking water contaminant candidate list said it needed more data uh, as an excuse for why TCP was not regulated at the federal level. Uh, that doesn't make a whole lot of sense to me um, because many states, California, New Jersey, Hawaii, are successfully measuring and regulating TCP today. Do you believe the TCP should be regulated by the US EPA? You know, I think our scientists have said, uh, correctly so, that states can move faster in some instances than the federal government. We take very serious our regulatory role. And when we set a regulation, we're responsible for setting a national regulation for 50 states. And we have to take those 50 or so states in account. And so this is why we have strong partnerships with our states, where in some states where we see certain vulnerabilities, states can move faster, and they're doing a good job of protecting their, their communities. In other states, there may not be that looming threat. And so we try to prioritize these regulatory approaches. And that's why you're seeing us approach this issue in the way that we are. We want to collect all of the data needed to set a federal regulation uh, that would be appropriate for the nation while also complementing the regulations that many states decide to move forward on quicker and faster than the federal government can. Thank you. I, I think the, the determinant uh, a, lot, a year ago was a was a mistake, and I'd really encourage the EPA to, to look at this contaminant seriously. Uh, one more question. With EPA's budget on, on civil enforcement of polluters, uh, can you talk about the EPA's plan to hold these large oil and chemical companies accountable for the contamination and removal of TCP from the water systems that they've contaminated over decades? Well, I think you'll notice in this budget that, again, uh, we're making a plea to get the resources we need. Uh, we have lost tremendous resources on the enforcement side. Uh, and, and I think a lot of our staff, quite frankly, um, are coming out of a COVID posture. We're ramping up the enforcement mechanisms where we believe it makes the most sense, uh, but we're, we're woefully understaffed. And so in this budget, you'll see that enforcement is a strong tool that I believe should be used where appropriate. Uh, but in order to use the tool appropriately, we need to have the appropriate number of, of inspectors and, and folks that can actually do the work. And you're going to see a budget or you're seeing a budget request in there uh, for 2023. We did not get the resources that we asked for in 2022. We're hoping to get it in 2023. But if we want to see more enforcement of the laws that are on the books in a responsible way, we have to have the resources to do it. Thank you for your answers. I hope we can work together on removing TCP and other toxins from our water systems, as well as making sure that we're holding the feet to the fire of the folks who uh, contributed to the situation we're, we're dealing with in many communities uh, like mine. Thank you. Absolutely. Thank you. Thank you very much, Mr. Simpson. Do you have questions this morning? Certainly. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Administrator, for being here today uh, and uh, talking about some of the subjects. Uh, I look forward to the day when we can actually sit down and talk person to person and uh, meet face to face and discuss some of some of these issues. Uh, there's a couple that I want to address uh, in this first round. I'll I'll deal with one of them. It's a never ending debate that has been going on ever since I've been in Congress, probably will be for the next 20 years. I hope not. But I it's a constant concern that I hear about from my farmers and ranchers and business owners across Idaho and really across the country. Uh, it's about the extremely broad definition of waters of the United States or WOTUS under the Clean Water Act. Considering there is a case related to the scope of the Clean Water Act pending before the Supreme Court, and this case is expected to address federal jurisdiction under WOTUS, it seems only logical that the EPA would hold off finalizing a rule until the Supreme Court has decided this case. Uh, however, in front of the Senate 
EPW committee just a few weeks ago, you stated that the EPA will forge ahead with rulemaking despite a pending case. Now, you talked about the resources that you need and so forth and talked about previous administrations underfunding. I suspect that means previous chairman of, of uh, the Appropriations Committee, me being one of them and uh, some others. What we've tried to do is right size the EPA budget, not underfund it. But this is an example of why is the EPA wasting critical staff time and resources rushing through a rulemaking that the Supreme Court is going to reconsider in just a few months anyway. This is some of the questions we have about how the EPA spends their money. Uh, and maybe that's why some of the budgets haven't been as robust in the past as you would like. Could you address that for me? Uh, thank you for that question. And yes, you know, I was just in North Carolina with USDA Agriculture Secretary Tom Vilsack, spending time with farmers and ranchers talking about this very issue. Uh, and, and here's the reality. We proposed a rule uh, last year uh, that basically uh, takes the rule back to pre-2015 decisions prior to President Obama's WOTUS uh, interpretation and prior to President Trump's uh, interpretation. What farmers and ranchers have told me on the ground is that they need some regulatory certainty. And despite the Trump and Obama administrations, there are still decisions that are being made that have farmers or ranchers in limbo. Uh, so what we've decided to do is move very pragmatically and say, let's go back to pre-2015, uh, before the last two rules were put into place. Let's try to codify some, uh, some uh, decisions that the Supreme Court has already spoken to. And let's box in some of the exemptions and the exceptions that farmers and ranchers need right now. Uh, we know that there's a Supreme Court case pending. Uh, that Supreme Court case will address some aspects of WOTUS, but it won't address all. Uh, it won't provide some of the certainty that we believe our farmers need sooner rather than later because they're making decisions right now. We also believe that if we move forward, uh, and we have done a lot of listening to our ranchers and farmers. As a matter of fact, we're now going through 10 roundtables that we're hosting all across the country, being hosted by our farmers and ranchers in my home state of North Carolina, being hosted by the Farm Bureau, because we're continuing to collect information and data. Decisions are being made right now, Farmers and ranchers need certainty. We believe we can put a strong rule in place if we finalize it in a way that will complement and be situated to move forward after we hear from the Supreme Court. Uh, so we have to walk and chew gum at the same time. I don't believe that it's a waste of, of, of uh, uh, staff time. Uh, I believe that uh, we have engaged with farmers and ranchers, uh, ag CEOs all across this country for over a year. And we want to make good on the promise that we've made, which is providing a durable rule that will give them some regulatory certainty sooner rather than later. Well, I appreciate that answer. I wish my ranchers and farmers and others felt the same way. Uh, they feel like they're being left out in this rulemaking process. And you're right. It is certainty that they want. And going back to the pre-15 uh, rule, that was the problem. It was the uncertainty that was created. That's why the courts have ruled twice. You need to rewrite this rule to create... Uh, some certainty in it so that people know what they're doing. And it just seems like writing a new rule in the midst of all this uncertainty with the case between uh, before the Supreme Court seems premature now when we don't know. I mean, you're going to spend time and money on this. I suspect whatever the Supreme Court decides, unless you have some pre-knowledge of what the court's going to say, uh, that you're going to have to adjust the rule that whatever it is that you write. It just seems like we're out of step here in trying to do this. But I appreciate your comments. I appreciate what you're trying to do. It is a frustrating problem for all of us that we ought to be able to come up to a conclusion. I've kind of come to the kind of come to the conclusion, no matter what rule we write, we're going to get sued. There's going to be more challenges. I don't know if this is an ever ending process and it is frustrating as hell. Well, and, and Congressman, I really appreciate that perspective. And I think you're right. There's a level of frustration that we all share. And I can tell you, in, in all earnest, in the conversations we're having, uh, continuing to move forward, whether we finalize or not before the Supreme Court ruling, uh, to continue to move forward, uh, we believe that there is a lot of work, a lot of good work that has been done. And we, we respect the Supreme Court's jurisdiction, obviously, and we believe our rule will be in position to respond and adjust to the Supreme Court ruling in a way that this process will be more advanced. So as soon as the Supreme Court speaks, 
we'll have the process advanced enough so that we'll be providing those farmers and ranchers certainty sooner than we would otherwise. If we stop right now, if we discontinue the conversations, if we discontinue the roundtables, we're gonna lose a lot of ground and we won't be poised for success after the Supreme Court rules. So we're trying to balance that and thread that needle. But I can assure you, it is in the effort to provide dur a durable rule and certainty to our, our farmers and ranchers. I come from an agricultural state of North Carolina. I've spent a lot of time on this issue. I spent time trying to interpret the Obama rule when I was a state secretary, and I spent time trying to prepare for the Trump rule. And I can tell you on the ground, neither rule provided that certainty that our farmers and ranchers are look for, looking for, and they were very hard to administer because of the uncertainty. So I am very sensitive to these needs. I'm very sensitive to our farmers and ranchers, and I hope we can work, continue to work together on this. Well, I appreciate that, and I'd invite you to come to Idaho and sit down with a round table of uh, people that have concerns about this and explain that to them and stuff, and uh, I'd love to have you do that. Uh, maybe we can set something like that up, but I will save my next round of, uh, of inquiry for the next round of, uh, of questions, and I yield back uh, Chairwoman, Ping Chairwoman Pingree. Great. Thank you. Thank you, both of you, on that important topic. Um, Mr. Cartwright, you are next. Oh, Thank Chair you. Cartwright, excuse me. Good morning, Chair Cartwright. Yes, I was highly offended, Chair Pingree. <laughs> Good morning, Chair Pingree and all of the intrepid members of the Interior Subcommittee of Appropriations and Administrator Regan, great to have you with us this morning. Congratulations on making Mike Simpson smile before 10 o'clock in the morning. That's, a, that's, a, that's an accomplishment. <laughs> Uh, Mr. Regan, as you, you may know, uh, I'm from northeastern Pennsylvania, and my district uh, lies within the Chesapeake Bay watershed for the most part. Millions of people in my district depend on uh, uh, that watershed. Millions of people in, the, in the, the, uh, the Chesapeake depend on the watershed for drinking water, jobs, seafood, recreation, lots more. But for years, as all of us know, the bay was too dirty to swim or fish in. And eventually the federal government stepped in to limit the pollution running off into the bay. Now we Pennsylvanians are proud of our natural resources. We care about keeping them healthy. And we want our families to have access to clean drinking water. We want to be able to fish and swim safely in our streams, our creeks, our rivers. We want to leave a legacy of clean water for generations to come. But here's the thing, cleaning up dirty water is not easy. It costs money to update our stormwater infrastructure and keep pollution out of our waterways. And for too long, homeowners and businesses in my district have been footing the bill for this work. We're talking about all kinds of people, including retired senior citizens on fixed incomes footing the bill for stormwater infrastructure improvements. Now making local communities shoulder that burden alone to restore the watershed is not a fair solution and it is not sustainable. So since joining this subcommittee, I've fought to increase investments in stormwater programs and secure Northeastern Pennsylvania's fair share of these federal dollars. And here's the question, Administrator Regan, how is the EPA supporting communities in their efforts to address stormwater runoff? Well, well, thank you for the question, Congressman. And, you know, I, I, I couldn't agree with you more. And I believe that that's why the president was so focused on uh, the $50 billion provided by the bipartisan infrastructure law, because we're seeing these stormwater issues all across the country. And we know that towns, cities, and localities should not bear the brunt uh, for paying for these. Uh, we are looking for the opportunity to apply bill dollars all across the country for stormwater. Uh, $50 billion for stormwater, wastewater, a number of our infrastructure needs. And we know that that's not enough resources, right? Which is why in this budget, you'll see the modest request that we're proposing so that we can help communities just like the one you just identified. Stormwater is so important because not only do we wanna prevent the runoff into our precious waters like the Chesapeake Bay, but we wanna prevent these flooding 
and these economic disasters that we're seeing from climate change and stormwater play such a critical role. So yes, we know that the resources we're requesting for this budget, coupled with the bipartisan infrastructure law resources will help communities just like yours all across the country. Thank you. You mentioned the IIJA and in that we have the Clean Water State Revolving Fund. And I'm sure that's what you're referring to. As you know, uh, that, uh, Congress recently made the single largest investment in water in our nation's history with the IIJA. That law provided $11.7 billion for the Clean Water State Revolving Fund alone. Can you talk briefly about opportunities for stormwater management projects under this Clean Water State Revolving Fund investment? There are absolutely tremendous opportunities there. I will say that of the $50 billion awarded to EPA, we all know that there are probably about 720 to 750 billion uh, of infrastructure needs as it relates to water infrastructure. So we do have a good shot in the arm uh, through our state revolving funds. We also have a few other financial resources that we can leverage uh, through uh, programs at EPA that will really come from some of the resources we're requesting from our budget. And that's the EPA Water Infrastructure and Re Resiliency Finance Center to help us think through how we make smart investments and leverage those resources. Green streets, green jobs, green towns, grants. There are some grant mechanisms that we believe we can add to this mix uh, that complement some of the solutions on the ground we're hearing from communities like yours. And then there's some other financing opportunities. We're gonna have to couple together all of EPA's financing resources to solve this problem sooner rather than later. It's about preventing runoff. It's about preventing flooding. It's about creating jobs. And it's also about the economic vitality of our communities. We should not continue to rebuild our communities in the same way and only have our businesses shut down and public health threatened because we can predict some of this and stormwater runoff is a significant contributor to that success. Thank you, Mr. Regan. Look forward to working with you on that. Yield back, Chair Pingree. Thank you. I'm Representative Lee, do you have questions this morning? I do. Thank you, Chair Pingree and Ranking Member Joyce. Uh, also, it's great to see you, Administrator. Um, you serve such a pivotal role right now at this time for our country and our planet, and EPA's budget request cites compelling and clear evidence of the changes to our climate reflected in rising temperatures, droughts, heat waves, and wildfires. I come from Nevada and uh, clearly we've seen this evidence firsthand with the worst drought in 1200 years. Uh, Administrator, the Water Sense Labeling Program is a public private partnership that is designed to make or to encourage users to save water, choosing water efficient products and services. And we've seen the difference that this product can make in drought impacted communities just like mine. Uh, just to give you a sense of how dire this situation is, just this week, uh, the water levels in Lake Mead became so low that one of the intakes responsible uh, for supplying the entire Las Vegas Valley with water is now visible above the lake surface. So this is long past an emergency. So I'm asking, can you commit uh, to continuing EPA's longstanding support uh, for the effective and empowering water sense program? Absolutely. And I appreciate you recognizing this program. This is a great example of uh, these resources that we get or asking for from you. It really highlights what a sense is a public private partnership. And it's also one of the best programs that highlights community solutions. So we absolutely want to continue to partner with you. It's a great way to show how the government and our corporate citizens and our communities can work together to solve local solutions, provide local, local solutions. Thank you. And um, I just want to ask, could you speak more broadly on how the EPA uh, is going to um, use the infrastructure bill uh, to address the unique water uh, infrastructure needs in the Nevada and the West? One of the great uh, parts about the bipartisan infrastructure law. Again, it doesn't inflate EPA in terms of flooding us with resources. It gives us the resources to pass through to the states. Uh, and that flexibility is so important because as you know, uh, the conditions in North Carolina are very different than the conditions in your state. 
And we know that there are members of your community and there are elected officials that have solutions that are ready to go. And so what we wanna be able to do is pass through these precious resources so that we can hit the ground running. Uh, we should not provide academic uh, solutions from here in Washington, DC. We need to get the resources into your community's hands to solve some of these problems. I think water reuse, water efficiency, uh, on the ground solutions that many of your stakeholders are already putting in motion need additional resources because we don't have a moment to lose. Absolutely. And I must say that uh, our local water authority has done an incredible job at conservation. Um, I want to turn to hard rock mining. Uh, the administration released the fundamental principles for domestic mining reform, highlighting the 500,000 legacy mining sites in the western U.S. alone and calling on Congress to formalize and fund a durable program to remediate these sites as well as provide uh, some legal certainty for Good Samaritans working to remain, remediate legacy pollution. The Nevada Division of Minerals estimated that there are some 300,000 abandoned mine features just in my home state alone. Meanwhile, the administration has recognized that there is not one single federal agency with the authority over domestic mining. Could you discuss uh, EPA's perspective and role in facilitating the cleanup of legacy mines? Absolutely. We know that these mines pose significant uh, a risk to human health and the environment. And while the Department of Interior is the principal uh, land management agency, we also recognize that we have a role to play. So to the point you just made, uh, there, it requires partnership. Uh, through EPA's Abandoned Mine Lands Program, we're partnering with DOI and other federal agencies uh, and coordinating with the states and tribes on the ground to provide technical uh, ex expertise in research, cleanup, and the redevelopment of these legacy mines. Uh, so, you know, we, we know that we have an important role. Uh, we're sort of following the Department of Interior's lead, uh, but we understand the severity that this poses to human health, and we're doing everything we can uh, to, 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 to accommodate this mission. That can be accomplished through uh, many of the resources we're asking for via this budget. But we know, as you raised, it's a significant issue. And so we're going to leverage the bipartisan infrastructure law resources to help expedite some of this cleanup as well through our Superfund program. Thank you. Uh, I have, I'm running out of time. I just sort of want to put a plug also uh, for EPA support for the uh, Good Samaritan cleanup uh, as well. So I'd love to follow up with you on that. Thank you, and I uh, yield the time I don't have. Thanks. <laughs> You're welcome to all the time you did not have, and thank you for your questions. Mr. Kilmer. Thank you, Madam Chair, and thanks, Mr. Administrator, for being with us today. Uh, I really appreciate the work that you and your team do. Uh, um, and in particular, I just want to praise and thank you for the work that the EPA does in protecting and restoring Puget Sound. Uh, as, as you likely know, Puget Sound is our nation's largest estuary by volume. It's the center of Washington State's economic engine. It's a place uh, where generations of Washingtonians and Native Americans have built their lives and made their livelihoods really important to our economy uh, through jobs in fishing and shellfish harvesting and maritime industries. On top of that, there are 19 federally recognized tribes that have made Puget Sound their home since time immemorial, including 17 with tribal treaty rights to harvest fish and shellfish. Uh, and as a consequence, the federal government has a trust responsibility to support Puget Sound recovery and uphold those treaty rights. That's, in my view, a critical environmental justice issue. Here's the problem. We have a really sick body of water and and uh, and the EPA's role in this, I think, is just profoundly important. I think now more than ever, there is a real opportunity for Congress and for your agency to take action to protect the sound for future generations. Look, we, we know that investing in restoring Puget Sound by addressing everything from persistent flooding and stormwater runoff to improving nearshore habitat and removing culverts that affect water quality and fish passage. All of that is essential for increasing climate resilience, for restoring salmon runs, and for creating good jobs. So first, I wanna to extend to you an invitation to, to come out and visit the Puget Sound region and just see firsthand 
the urgency and importance of protecting Puget Sound. The weather is particularly nice in the summer, so I uh, would, would love to have you uh, visit. But I'm also, also hoping you can just speak to some of the opportunities you see to strengthen the EPA's partnership role uh, in Puget Sound, including funding for the Puget Sound Geographic Program. Well, n- number one, I, I thank you for your leadership on the Puget Sound. I think with the the resources that you all have really fought hard for in our geographic programs, they're, they're making a tremendous difference, uh, you know, for all of our uh, national treasures, but especially for the Puget Sound. And I appreciate you highlighting the fact that uh, this is a perfect example of tourism, uh, jobs, the economy, uh, ecosystem protection, public health protection, the impacts of climate change, all of these things converge together. And we wanna work very diligently with you on solutions. Uh, I believe that our work with the Puget Sound Partnership, state agencies and tribes and others has supported gains uh, in a comprehensive regional plan to restore the sound, leveraging over a billion dollars for recovery. Uh, we've got ni- we partnered with 19, as you say, federally recognized tribes and an international collaboration with Canada. I think taking that international approach is so critical, but also uh, the nation to nation relationship rebuilding with those, those tribes really helps us to understand you know, exactly what approaches we take and why we take them. Uh, there are cultural reasons that our partners want this work done. There are health reasons. There are economic reasons. Um, I, we've seen a net increase of over 6,000 acres of shellfish beds and over 41,000 acres of habitat protected or restored by the partnership we've already started. So the goal for us is to keep the pedal to the metal, continue to strengthen our partnerships. And we can do that because of the resources you have already invested, but we need more. As you said, this is a sick body of water. We have a lot of work to do, but we're ready to do that work. I'm really pleased to hear you say that. I think these investments do pay off. And and I also appreciate your just acknowledgement that this requires a coordinated approach that includes strong federal investment, but also partnership alongside state and tribal efforts. In that regard, that's actually why um, I introduced a bill called the Puget SOS Act, which is focused on funding, certainly funding, but also establishing a Puget Sound Recovery National Program Office in the EPA and codifying the Puget Sound Federal Leadership Task Force that was set up uh, under the Obama administration, that would ensure that the federal government steps up to assist with the regional efforts that are required to save our sound and to restore salmon and orca populations and ensure future generations have access to these same economic opportunities and uphold tribal treaty rights. The bill did pass the House on suspension last year, and uh, I, I certainly hope I can count on your partnership and support for hopefully getting it across the finish line this Congress. You can absolutely uh, count on our partnership. I, as a former state regulator, listen, I I really, really, really respect cooperative federalism. I know what can be done on the state level if you have a strong federal partnership, and I know that things can't be done if you don't have a strong federal partnership. So I take this role very serious, and I understand what the states need, what the tribes need, and we cannot do this alone. So Yes, you have our strong uh, partnership and commitment to continue to work across the state, federal, and tribal boundaries. Thank you, Mr. Administrator, and thank you, Madam Chair. I yield back. Thank you. Uh, Chair McCollum, do you have some questions this morning? Yes, yes, I do. Um, First, welcome, Administrator. Um, Welcome to the Interior Subcommittee. And I just want to say that uh, because of the work and leadership of Chair Pingree, we were able to have increases and Uh, to the uh, important work you do in the Environmental Protection Agency. And we look forward to funding that work into the future uh, because you provide uh, human health and a healthy environment. And that's important to the success of our national security. And it's also important to family and personal security too. So thank you for your work. I'm going to ask you a question about some budgetary needs. But first, I want to touch on Uh, something that's been a strategy that I've been working with the committee on, uh, and it has to do with the Mississippi River. Uh, The subcommittee directed the EPA to develop uh, a strategy for fiscal year 2021 in a report. Um, Could you please tell me uh, where we are in this process with the Mississippi River Restoration and Resilience Strategy? Absolutely. We are so eager to work with you on the Mississippi uh, River Restoration Strategy, we have actually turned in our homework to the Office of Management and Budget. 
Uh, we believe that we put forward a very, very strong strategy. We're waiting for them to grade our homework. And once they get it back to me, I look forward to sharing with you what that product looks like and where we go from there. Well, everybody's invited you to their district, so I'm happy to invite you to the headwaters, but I will include the rest of the Mississippi River down to the Gulf in Louisiana uh, to uh, look at some of the work that we can do together on that and protect this great working river and the habitat and the communities that live alongside of it. Absolutely. Given your background in North Carolina, you're very familiar <clears throat> with what this agency needs to do to address PCOS. Uh, the agency's strategic roadmap says by the end of 2021 that the agency was going to issue orders to, uh, to companies to require them to provide information about the health effects of some of these substances, information we currently don't have. And um, I think all of us on the committee, but especially the, the, the chair, I know we need to have SAP. So we're hearing that there's some delays in getting the Toxic Substance Control Act back on track from the previous administration. It's a vital, important gatekeeper in preventing the next set of uh, dangerous chemicals like PFAS from getting into commerce without first taking steps to make sure that they're safe. So what can you tell us about these delays? What are you doing to address them? What can we do to help you address them? And, um, you know, we just want to make sure that the EPA is going to be able to do its task reviews and prioritize them in a timely fashion to protect the most vulnerable populations. And then that includes the children here in the United States. Well, absolutely. And I think that the TOSCA, the new TOSCA law is, is a great example of bipartisan approach to some of the most dangerous chemicals in this country. Unfortunately, during the previous administration, um, after TOSCA reform was put into place, the, the previous administration didn't ask for any resources and didn't put a plan in place to implement the law as you all dictated, uh, which is why uh, this agency has missed nine of the first 10 chemical risk evaluation deadlines. We walked into a situation where the agency actually was not funded to do the work that Congress asked us to do. And so that's why we only right now have about 50% of what we think we need to review the safety of new chemicals as quickly as possible, not only to follow the law that Congress has asked, but that the private sector wants to see so that we can get things moving and put the right replacement chemicals on the markets. Uh, you see a very genuine budget request here for TOSCA support and implementation. Congress has given us the marching orders we don't have the resources to get the job done on time and on budget. And so we are asking for those resources so that we can make up for lost time and keep pace with a very strong law that you all have asked us to perform. Well, you can, I, I'll speak for myself right now. You can count on me to do whatever I can to help you with that and to make sure that as um, people are, uh, you know, asking questions as to why you're behind in your homework. I'm a former teacher. I can tell them you were never given the homework uh, tools to complete to complete the assignment. So we're going to write that wrong, and we're going to work with you on that. Thank you very much, Madam Chair. Thank you so much for your questioning, um, Chair Captor. Do you have some questions this morning? Thank you, Madam Chair, uh, very much. Uh, thank you for this great hearing and. Uh, I want to thank Secretary or Administrator Regan for coming to Ohio to the heart of the industrial Midwest and to making that trip on such a cold, cold, windy day. Uh, thank you <laughs> very, very much. And uh, I'm glad to see you back in, in Washington. Um, the, I just want you to know that the woman whose home you visited, uh, Karen George, and the work of lead pipe removal has given new hope to that neighborhood. Uh, where they actually were re-energized to work with uh, their local uh, organizations to try to get abandoned buildings ripped down and community gardens established. And so the lead pipe removal became a um, sign of hope uh, for that area, uh, Mr. Administrator. So know that I and they thank you very, very much. Uh, and you're, you're always welcome here, always. Thank you. Uh, I wanted to... Um, uh, turn to the bipartisan infrastructure law in its relationship to EPA. And uh, we know that there was significant new funding in BIF 
for um, expanding alternative fuel infrastructure and alternative fuel vehicles, including natural gas vehicles. <clears throat> As part of these new uh, programs, a lot of the funds will go to electric vehicles, and um, but Congress also made sure that other low emission and alternative fuel vehicles qualify for many of the new programs. In fact, we just had a situation where <clears throat> the labs at the um, uh, Department of Energy cleared a Class 8 truck to come to Washington and go back, uh, fueled completely 100% on ethanol. and. Um, so um, one of my questions is, how does the EPA and the administration plan to ensure that the intent to encourage a variety of alternative fuel vehicles is honored? And um, uh, because I represent companies like um, Ford that makes uh, the heavy trucks at Avon Lake, Ohio. I represent uh, the Ford EcoBoost engine plant at Brook Park, Ohio. I represent the General Motors transmission facility, which has had its employment cut by half because they make transition uh, transmissions for conventional vehicles, and also the Jeep Wrangler plant at Toledo, their largest facility on the continent. So the automotive industry is at the heart of so much of our job base here, and this transition will be difficult for the country um, and certainly for the people that I represent. So I'm interested in alternatives, new technology, what EPA's role might be with the um, uh, new infrastructure bill. And then secondly, I just want to make you conscious, not that you can do anything about this, but maybe you can be a voice inside the administration indirectly. I've come to learn that with this transition to new vehicles, uh, I've gotten in a lot of garages where old vehicles are being repaired, garbage trucks for cities, uh, police cars, fire engines, um, the uh, whole public fleet that exists, ex excavators, all this equipment that's out there, and the conditions in which the people who repair them work. And uh, learning that, in fact, in places like Ohio, maybe it's not true in other states, but we have a rampant pulmonary illness and uh, cancers, lung cancers, because of breathing in diesel emissions. There's no real voice for this um, because of the manner in which the repair work is fragmented across counties, cities, bus companies, transit authorities. It's very interesting. They work in these old crummy buildings. And uh, in Ohio, I found out from the firefighters, our firefighters are not even covered um, <clears throat> by OSHA. I couldn't believe it. I know that's not your job. But uh, if you go to Cleveland, if you come to Toledo, Lorraine, I'll take you to these garages. I have the county garages. Um, it's very hard to get your arms around this, but we know we're one million mechanics short in our country today. And part of the reason is because the career has not been modernized in the sense of making sure that they work in safe facilities. I don't know what EPA can do about that. Maybe you can point out the best places in the country where this is occurring. Maybe we can work with labor uh, department and education department on a training program so that it is a respected profession and not just tangential. Uh, we're talking about a lot of people and young people that we want to attract to this field. And so I just wanted to point out that uh, issue to you to how to make it environmentally clean profession. Uh, it's a dangerous profession. And um, so clean, changing to a new energy age also means helping the people who will be doing the work. And there's not a focus on, you can hardly find the word mechanic in the BIF bill, thousand pages or whatever it is. They talk about workforce. Well, that's not enough. We have to care about the people and where they work. And maybe EPA could help us be a voice there. So um, thank you for listening. And my question goes back to what can we do with the infrastructure law uh, to, and what is your authority to ensure that we will have a variety of alternative uh, fueled vehicles and that they are safe and clean? Well, well, thank you for that question. And, and I will definitely work with labor and HHS and identify our role as we think about the safety of mechanics in those conditions. The, the president has said that we have to have a whole of government approach. And anytime we hear a question, we take it back to the team and we try to think about a solution, even if it doesn't fit neatly into one of our purviews. So I will take that back. Um, 
More importantly, I think on the fuels piece, uh, I've had a lot of conversations uh, with Secretary Vilsack uh, and, and Secretary Buttigieg uh, and Secretary Granholm about the evolution of our technologies as we think about fuel choices. Uh, we know that uh, electric vehicles are the future, but they're not going to be readily available for everyone tomorrow. We also know that our agriculture industry plays an important role in this transition. And so as we think about advanced technologies, we also think about advanced biofuels and advanced fuels. And so this transition, we know, will take place over time. There is a role for agriculture in that transition, and we are really focused on making sure that that role is properly managed. The other thing that Secretary uh, Vilsack often says and reminds me of is there's also a big play in our aviation fuel space as well. And so EPA, DOT, and the Department of Agriculture are thinking very seriously and strategically about the role of biofuels and advanced biofuels as we advance our transportation sector. That being both you know, uh, vehicles, uh, uh, ground uh, vehicles, and uh, aviation vehicles as well. Mr. Uh, Administrator, thank you so very much. I just will say that the first biofuel plane flown by the National Guard in our country was flown out of our district almost 20 years ago, and uh, one of our little jets. And uh, so the 180th Fighter Wing in Ohio distinguished itself, even got on the cover of uh, uh, Buckeye Guard a magazine and so forth. So it was a guard unit. It wasn't active, you know, it wasn't active duty. It was a guard unit. So they're out here in, in rural America and uh, trying to make a difference. So um, maybe we'll get you up in one of those planes sometime. <laughs> uh, I, I, I love your energy. I love your positive attitude. All the best to you. And thank you so much for answering my questions today. Well, thank you. And I think, you know, I come from a rural state and I know that our agricultural economy is so vital to what this country is doing. The president pledged that agriculture would have a seat at the table. Advanced biofuels would have a role in this low carbon future. And we're going to keep that commitment. Thank you so much. And you get that DOD involved. Uh, we, had drag, we had to drag them, drag them. Believe me, they didn't even think about energy. It wasn't even on their mind. Uh, it was the Marine Corps that led the way because they were dying for it. So they understood the problem and a resupply and so forth in theater. So uh, uh, believe me, there's some folks over there that now do care. Well, if I might add, I know we're over time, but I can tell you the relationship that I have with Secretary Austin, I believe is historic. And I can tell you on climate change and on PFAS, I've had no stronger partner than uh, Secretary Austin. That's great. Well, thank you both for that exchange. And uh, I'm thrilled to know the first biofuel <laughs> plane went up 20 years ago. Uh, we, we got some catch up to do here that, that uh, seems like we should have figured that out a long time ago. But thank you both for that. And um, now we have an opportunity to ask a few more questions. Uh, Mr. Reagan, if you have uh, time, we'd be uh, happy to welcome questions from other members of the committee who want um, to take up another topic. And I will just start with, uh, with myself. Um, I'm really pleased to see that for the first time, and it's sort of surprising it's the first time, but EPA's strategic plan includes a new goal focused specifically on addressing climate change. Um, clearly, it's long overdue that, that we have that focus, and I really look forward to supporting you in your work towards achieving the goal. So can you just describe a little bit how your uh, budget request in, intends to achieve the goal and your focus on climate change? Absolutely, and this is a great uh, way to sort of highlight how uh, you know, a lot of people refer to them as regulations, but they're really technology standards. And Congress basically gave us an assignment to phase down hydrofluorocarbons. Uh, we proposed a rule and finalized that rule. We're working with the industry to reduce HFCs uh, by 85% in 15 years and do it in a way where we're transitioning uh, our economy. Uh, so there you see uh, and ask for resources for technical expertise and ability to continue to work with the private sector. When you look at our finalized rule for light duty vehicles, cars and trucks, we did that in concert with the automobile industry, the UAW and our unions. And we looked at what was technologically feasible to drive the economy in a way where we're reducing greenhouse gas emissions, but we're remaining globally competitive uh, with our international competition. Uh, and we're also doing it and keeping those jobs right here at home. 
Uh, so our technology standards and our regulations to reduce climate, we believe we're doing a great job working with the industry. Uh, look at our oil and gas sector, our methane regulations. We have proposed one of the most stringent regulations to reduce and capture methane that this country has ever seen. But it was done because uh, API and the chamber said, we need some rules of engagement and rules of the road and how we're gonna reduce that pollutant. I've worked very closely with the power sector and their CEOs to understand what technologies are available, what's cost effective, how do we capture those emissions but equally as important, how do we capture that lost product? Because that product, that gas is valuable. Uh, so on cars, on methane, on hydrofluorocarbons, and we're also beginning to look at our power sector more holistically. We are convening meetings, putting strong regulations in place and reducing the threat that climate change poses while continuing to create jobs and advance our economy. The last thing I'll say is everything that we've done as it relates to climate change in the rules that we've proposed has been done in a way to capture innovation, entrepreneurship, and remain globally competitive while we protect public health. Great, that's, that's really helpful to hear that description. And we certainly uh, appreciate that lens that you have on it. Um, you know, one other part of this, and I know you've brought it up, uh, you know, in, in other uh, questions, it's just this whole government approach. And I, I'd love to hear more about how you're working with, um, you know, both the whole government at the federal level, but also tribal, state, local agencies, you know, just to make sure that there's a lot of coordination going on. That seems like an important role for your agency. You know, just uh, maybe a month ago, um, you know, our environmental council of states held a meeting in my home state of North Carolina. I, I met with, I believe, 45 of the 50 environmental state commissioners and secretaries to talk about the relationship, the appropriate relationship that federal and state should have. We are also hosting a lot of conversations with our tribal sovereign governments as well and looking at how we do some nation to nation partnership building. It's very important uh, for me to stress that if we're going to achieve our goals, we have to have strong partnerships with our states and our tribes. We have to take advantage of the autonomy that they possess so that there can be creative solutions on the ground. That is extremely important. Equally as important is for me to have a strong relationship with Secretary Austin as we think about our national security as it relates to climate change or how we think about contamination in water that has plagued our, our, our retirees, our veterans and our soldiers for years, just like some of our civilian communities. A strong relationship with Secretary Vilsack. Uh, there's a lot of consternation around pesticides, herbicides, waters of the US. I cannot make these decisions in a vacuum. I have to consult with Secretary Vilsack. Uh, Marty Walsh on labor. There are implications to our technology standards and regulations on economic development and job growth. Secretary Raimondo in Commerce, Marty Walsh in Labor, if we're not talking, we're not meeting the moment. So as we think about the bipartisan infrastructure law, as we think about these investments that we hopefully get from you all in Congress, we're leveraging all of these resources to make sure the federal government is speaking in one voice and leveraging the partnership, the appropriate partnership we should have with our state, tribal, and local officials. Great, great. Thank you for that answer. And uh, we really look forward to you and look forward to supporting you in that work. Uh, Ranking Member Joyce, would you like to ask some more questions? Yes, yeah, <clears throat> thank you uh, again, Chair Pingree. Um, <clears throat> Administrator, do the administration's goals to limit emissions from mobile sources not dictate that recyclable materials should be transported the shortest distance possible from their point of origin to processing locations? And how can this goal coexist with the way EPA has interpreted and tried to implement environmental justice actions under this administration? You know, as I think we look at the holistic picture, yes, we want to uh, limit emissions for climate reasons. We also want to limit emissions in terms of public health exposure, putting people first. I, I don't believe that they're, they're false options. I believe that these goals can coexist. You know, one of the things that we'd like to do is make sure that these facilities have the appropriate control technologies and measures so that they don't put their community members in danger. We also want to be realistic, though. Some of our communities in this country have been dumped on. Some communities have a disproportionate number and level of industrial processes, chemical manufacturers, coal plants. And it's unfair for any community, 
because of race, because of economic status, to have all of these polluting facilities located in just one area. We have to spread some of these things out. It's not that we have to go without. We just have to think more strategically about placement to ensure that all people are equally protected under the law. Well, when you opposed a particular scrap metal recycling permit application in Chicago, were you aware that the only other large metal shredding facility in the city was in an environmental justice area <clears throat> that is more densely populated than the southeast side? Were you aware that the other operation is located closer to schools and homes? Were you aware that this facility was operating and continues to operate without any of the pollution controls on its shredder? I was aware that this facility operated on the north side of town and the community motivated. Uh, it was a, a, a better uh, financed community, a community that had stronger representation uh, from their elected officials, and that that facility was relocated because of persistent violations of the Clean Air Act and other uh, violations. So the record wasn't strong. So when that facility moved from the north side of town to the southeast side of town, where those community members have been persistently dumped on, what EPA said was, let's take a pause I'm not gonna make the decision. The decision is the mayor's decision, but EPA will provide the mayor with the technical assistance needed to properly evaluate the health impacts. The city used those resources by EPA and HHS and came to the determination that there would be a disproportionate impact to that community. And with the track record that that company had for violating the law, I believe that the city made the proper determination that that was not an ideal location for that facility. When you refer to the denial of such permit as environmental justice at work, were you aware of the fact that the overwhelmingly and admittedly conservative health impact assessment yielded results that were well within the EPA's benchmarks? I think when you take a look at the decision that the city made, I think the city made a decision that when you look at the cumulative impact of the disproportionate pollution that that community would bear, uh, the city made the determination that permitting one more facility could potentially be that straw that breaks the camel's back for that community. Again, EPA's role was to provide technical assistance and resources to the city so that the city could make the proper determination. I believe that Mayor Lightfoot made the right decision because I follow science and I follow data and I follow the law. And when you look at all three of those things, I believe the city of Chicago made the right decision. And I think it's important to really keep our eye on the ball. The city of Chicago made that decision. EPA provided additional resources so that they could properly evaluate the health impacts, but the city of Chicago made that decision. Well, Administrator Reagan, I'd, I'd be remiss if I, I uh, didn't address the Great Lakes. My dear friend and colleague, uh, Marcy Cantor, I'm gonna beat her to this, but I'm sure she'll expound upon it. Um, in my backyard, uh, Lake Erie here is especially prone to the dangerous impacts of hazard, <clears throat> hazardous algal blooms. And, and given it's warm, shallow, especially up in uh, Marcy's end, the more the, and has the most shoreline development of the Great Lakes. While I recognize the agency is focused on delisting areas concerned, given the issues Governor DeWine outlined in his January 2022 letter to the agency, can you take a moment to explain how EPA plans to prioritize and distribute GLRI dollars to reduce toxin producing harmful algal blooms and improve water quality in the Great Lakes. Absolutely, and I know that Bill does put a priority on the AOCs, but we also know that we need to direct resources to really focus on these algal blooms. Uh, I believe we've invested approximately $10 million of GLRI funds each year in Lake Erie, uh, focusing on nutrient reduction efforts. Uh, from 2015 through 2020, uh, I believe that number has exceeded about 60 million. So we wanna ramp that up, uh, which is why I believe you'll see in the budget, there's a reflection to really focus on important issues like these algal blooms. I am also spending a lot of time with my good friend, USDA Secretary Tom Vilsack, because we know that we have nutrient runoff occurring. We also wanna leverage the bipartisan infrastructure law and the resources we're asking for, for our water program, because we know storm water is a significant contributor here. Uh, so Representative, I can tell you, Congressman, I can tell you, I am looking across all of my programs, trying to you know, leverage every dollar. I don't wanna rob Peter to pay Paul. I wanna be able to leverage all of my resources 
and channel and focus on these important issues that you're raising. And I know these algal blooms are critically important, not just for public health, but the economic vitality of that national treasure that you sit so closely to. Well, thank you very much. And uh, you'll find that we, on this committee, we're bipartisan in our preservation of the Great Lakes. So uh, I pass it off to Marcy. Uh, to, she'll be able to ask you some more questions. <laughs> thank you, sir. Double teaming on the Great Lakes there. Um, let's see, Mr. Kilmer, do you have some more questions? Thanks, Madam Chair. I just have one and, and hopefully won't uh, exhaust too much time. Um, uh, I, I wanted to just continue, Mr. Administrator, on the importance of investing in Puget Sound, but in, in so doing, wanted to just highlight another program uh, that I think is really important, and that's the National Estuary Program, which, as you know, is an EPA program to protect and restore water quality and ecological integrity for estuaries of national significance. Obviously, Puget Sound is one of the big ones in that regard. I was just hoping you could speak to how the EPA intends to strengthen the important work done under that program. Oops, sorry, I'm not hearing you. You may be on mute. Oh, I'm sorry. You're speaking of the National Estuary Program? The Estuary Program, correct. What I'll do, uh, Congressman, is get back with you on the specifics of, of that correlation of those two programs. Super. Um, thank you. We'll, we'll uh, happy to uh, follow up with your team. And um, again, it's, it's one of those that has an impact on a lot of our nation's estuaries and certainly Puget Sound among them. So we'll look forward to following up with your team. And thank you, Madam Chair. I'll yield back. Thank you. Thank you, um, Mr. Simpson. Thank you, Chair Owen. Uh, this is the second series of questions I wanted to ask you on the second subject. It's one that I brought up. Uh, first of all, let me just say I'm happy that uh, Mr. Cartwright recognized that I can smile before noon. It's not often, but occasionally I can. So uh, I'm glad somebody <laughs> recognized that. This is a subject that was brought up uh, somewhat in, around about in, in a different manner uh, with Congressman Lee, and that's about a abandoned mine sites and cleaning up abandoned ma mine sites. This is a subject that I brought up with both the Secretary of Energy and the Secretary of Interior and anyone else who would listen. Uh, as you know, uh, critical minerals are critical. And unfortunately, a lot of the critical minerals that we have in this country, we rely on other uh, countries that don't like us for the supply of them. If you're going to reach your climate goals and renewable energy and those types of things, uh, you can't outstrip our ability to deliver the critical minerals that are necessary in batteries and solar and other things, and for our defense purposes, frankly. Uh, the Defense Department is very concerned about, uh, about uh, the, the supply of critical minerals. Uh, as you know, as you probably know, Idaho is rich in what is deemed critical minerals, and some of those in Idaho are significant in their applications. Uh, and we shouldn't rely on foreign countries that don't like us for those. And it's important that we get these out of the ground here in Idaho, in, in, in this country, uh, in a responsible way. So I want, to add, I want to tell you a story about what's going on, and then I want to uh, ask you a series of questions and, and have you uh, their thoughts on it. Cobalt and antimony are very critical minerals, frankly. Uh, antimony, if you, if defense is very concerned about it, uh, and it's critical in our renewable energy goals, uh, frankly. Uh, and so there is a mine in Idaho that was developed during World War II. It was used to... to uh, to mine antimony that was used for war purposes in World War II. After the war, it was abandoned. It's been sitting up there in the, in the mountains of Idaho, uh, and the tailings are there. There is, uh, there is uh, runoff from those tailings that pollute the waters and some other things that blocks access to uh, a few hundred miles of salmon, potential salmon habitat and those types of things. There's a, there's a company that's come in that wants to clean it up, frankly and remind those tailings and, uh, and clean the water and, and everything else. They've got a heck of a good plan there. It's taken them so far six years uh, to get licensed and they're not licensed yet, but it's six years. The cobalt mine that, that uh, is in Idaho has taken 10 years, a decade to get licensed for this. Uh, that's just too long. Uh, and so let me ask you these series of questions. I'm, I'm, uh, am I correct that you support A, the president's critical minerals agenda? 
Do you agree that we should focus on remining historical mining districts as opposed to greenfield frontier projects that would open new mining if we can do this by remining sites? Uh, will you support remining projects that would have the co-benefit of improving the environmental conditions at historical mine sites? And finally, and maybe most importantly, will the EPA demonstrate flexibility in the permitting process to permit remining for critical minerals that improves the condition of the environment at the site, improves it, but not necessarily the extreme position to meeting uh, pre-mining conditions, conditions that existed before there was ever a mine there. If we don't do this, and this, and to me, the research I've done on this makes perfect sense, but if we don't do this, what you're going to leave is just a site that still continues to pollute the river and other things with runoffs uh, and not have the ability to clean this up. So I think we can work together to solve this, but part of it is getting the permitting process streamlined so that we can get it done and clean up these sites. And when you are going to the Puget Sound and flying over Idaho, there are a couple airports that I can have you land at and we can get on our jeans and boots and they would be happy to take us up there and show us some incredible country and what's going on up there. So listen, I, I look forward to your response on this, but let me say before I quit that uh, I know sometimes it sounds like I'm really critical of the EPA. I'm not. I think you do a very important job and I look forward to working with you to make sure that we can do this job that we all want to do of making sure that we have a clean environment. Thank you. Well, I, I appreciate the question and I look forward to visiting with you and your district and, and, and doing exactly what you just laid out because I believe we have to get out from behind the desk in Washington DC and actually see things with our own eyes, listen and bring these things back to Washington DC. So I look forward to the district visit. I do support the president's aggressive goals uh, as it relates to critical mining. I'm also talking with uh, my counterparts. It is, this is once again, another whole of government approach. It's very important that DOI, DOD, EPA, commerce, it's important that we're all looking at the needs if we want to win the 21st century in terms of this global competition to reduce climate change, but grow jobs and grow the economy at the same time. We can't ignore that we have betrayed the trust of many people in the past because we haven't done some of this mining right in the past. And so what we have to do is restore public trust. We have to have processes in place where the federal government actually talks across agencies and looks for the most expedient ways to get access to these critical minerals while protecting public health and the environment. I believe that we can do that. You've raised some very good points that that has taken six, 10, 15 years. Well, there has been no administration and no president has focused on this issue like this president. There's been no president that says, all of these agencies must work together if we're gonna win the 21st century. So yes, I believe that we can put the proper processes in place to access critical minerals in a way that supports our climate goals and allows for us to win the 21st century and grow a lot of jobs. Thank you for that. And I look forward to working with you on it. Thank you for being here today and thanks for the important job you do. Thank you so much. Thank you. That's a, a really important topic, and I, I feel like I, I learned a little bit there. So, um, Chair Captor, uh, it is your time to discuss the Great Lakes or anything <laughs> else you choose. All right. Well, I got three little points, and I will end with the Great Lakes, and I'm so glad that Congressman Joyce uh, and I are able to co-chair the Great Lakes Task Force. We really have our work cut out for us, I'll tell you. Uh, but let me begin with this. Uh, Mr. Uh, Administrator, you mentioned you're good friends with Secretary Austin. Well, I have an idea. And it would take leadership by both of you. And I know you got your hands full. But as we think about the new world of vehicles, uh, the Department of Defense spends an enormous amount of money going around the country before their air shows, like with the Thunderbirds. And they have a ground show. They bring in big rocket trucks and they bring in all these uh, vehicles and there's hundreds of thousands of people and they cheer the Department of Defense and the Thunderbirds. And I've often thought that that could be just a tremendous place to introduce uh, environmentally clean technologies that are in uh, that are either working or in the development stages uh, that would educate and inspire across our country. Uh, the Marine Corps has got some vehicles they've worked on and so forth. Uh, but I think in the area of cars and trucks, which somewhat fall under you, uh, we could do a lot more. 
And I also think that there should be a national program that inspires our young people that we want to go into the fields of technology at places that you've never heard of, like Norwalk Dragway in Ohio and Milan Dragway up in Michigan, just north of Toledo. These are places where the future is being born. Nobody pays attention to these individual young people that are trying to get a double-A fuel dragster to go faster than the guy in the other lane. And this is where our talent comes from. We don't see it at the federal level. Uh, they, you know, they go to these big companies and all that, but down here where we have the people that live right next door to the automotive industry or probably out in Bear Kilmer State where they live right next door to where airplanes are made, uh, th there's tremendous opportunity that I think that we miss and that we don't inspire. So I think there should be a prize for, you know, the new American car that are, you know, that's built by young people who are under 25 years of age or, or whatever. Uh, something, something creative has to be done there to inspire them that they matter. They matter because they're different than kids that just, you know, maybe are advantage their whole lives and uh, go on to Harvard or wherever. And these kids are down here working with raw material every day. Um, so I they're trying to work on electric cars in their little classrooms in high school and all. Uh, and they're, wor they're really worth uh, paying attention to. So I just want to, I'll send you something on that. But I think we should build the new American car uh, starting with them. And uh, uh, I think your department and Secretary Austin could really do something with these shows that the military puts on anyway all across the country. Uh, so that's number one. I don't expect you to respond, uh, but uh, just be interested. Secondly, for the Great Lake cities that are heavily burdened with uh, environmental debt, uh, we're trying to do our job, but Detroit and Cleveland each have a municipal bonded indebtedness of more than $2 billion, most of which is due to environmental uh, mandates. Toledo owes little, little Toledo now. $1.6 billion. They're at the base of a watershed that rains into it. So the poorest community has to pay for all these environment, environmental mandates. And the region that surrounds it walks away without those responsibilities. Uh, Milwaukee, 1.4 billion. So as we think about the problems of the Great Lakes, if there's any group in your uh, agency that could take a look at uh, bonded indebtedness in the Great Lakes, related to environment and some possible solutions. Maybe Brian Deese could help us come up with some solutions with his knowledge of finance. But to sometimes put this debt on the poorest places is absolutely morally wrong. And I know that uh, Congressman Joyce probably asked you Beulah and some of the smaller communities, you know, uh, something's wrong with this formula. And um, so I just wanted to, uh, to point that out and uh, see if there isn't a way to help us uh, think through a more creative financing mechanism. Uh, finally, with the Great Lakes, again, we are in real trouble. We are in real trouble. Uh, if there's any way you could set up a task force across agencies, including Terry Cosby at the National uh, Natural Resource Conservation Service at USDA, um, uh, yourself and people you would appoint, um, some of the clean climate people, uh, maybe over at the White House. I don't know, <clears throat> but we're losing this battle. <clears throat> the um, invasive species that have come into the Great Lakes, removing the natural phytoplankton, uh, and the accelerating growth of um, algal blooms, uh, it's overwhelming. And our lake is the shallowest. Erie is the shallowest. Ontario is in terrible shape because she gets our uh, water once uh, it comes out of the Great Lakes. But we have no political boundary for the problem. The problem of Lake Erie lies in Michigan, Indiana, Ohio, and Western Ontario. Yeah, we have a lot of agencies and we give them a lot of money, but there's no concerted focus uh, for every month what we have to do uh, to make a difference. In the Western Basin of Lake Erie, I can tell you there are no uh, facilities above lagoons, um, manure lagoons, that turn that uh, effluent into power. Uh, yeah, the governor has a program, but it hasn't. And we put millions of dollars working with the secretary, with um, uh, Senator Stabenow from up in Michigan, uh, and David Joyce and others 
from using, using USDA funds to try to get out into the watershed and try to contain the phosphorus that's coming toward the lake. But half our land is absentee owned. So there aren't farmers. There aren't farmers there to really tend the land. It is an enormous problem. We need some kind of strike force for Lake Erie to save it. Um, I'm not unhopeful, but I am extremely worried at this point. And uh, Toledo experienced something very terrible in 2014. You're aware of that. It's going to happen again uh, if we don't deal with this. Uh, it is a massive environmental challenge. And uh, so um, I'm asking for a consideration of a strike force involving the agencies, if you could just give that consideration. Thank you very much. Well, well, thank you for that, Congresswoman. And I will take that idea back of the strike force to the cabinet, and we can see what we can do with that suggestion. I can tell you, and thank, thank you all for your leadership in giving us the resources to begin to try to address some of these issues. EPA is throwing everything we have at the Great Lakes. And, you know, on the, the issue of the, the bond and the indebtedness, I think that what, what I'd like to do, we do have an environmental finance board that I will take that back to, to see if they've been thinking about this issue, what solutions they might have. If they haven't been thinking about these issues, I will be sure to let them know uh, that you have asked for us to take a strong look at that. Um, you know, I, I love this. Uh, I love the fact that bipartisanship is working here between you and and, and Congressman um, uh, from Ohio. Uh, I don't know if I like being the recipient of the double team, but it's, uh, it's a rare and beautiful thing to see. The, the, the Great Lakes is a national treasure. We understand that. We know we're playing catch up. And so I appreciate the way you all are asking these questions and formulating these requests because I believe that there are certain aspects of it that we can meet the moment of, but there are some that are really huge mountains to climb. And we look forward to tackling those mountains with you. Um, I can also tell you that I love your idea about youth engagement. Yeah. I'm in the process of creating a youth council here at EPA because as I travel the country, some of the best ideas are coming from our youth. And what I'll do is we're trying to look at criteria for who's on that council. You've just given us some really great criteria to add to that potential idea. And, and, and in terms of your request uh, with uh, DOD, uh, there's a gentleman that likes to test drive electric vehicles that happens to run the country that is leaning on Secretary Austin more than I ever could. So I think having cleaner vehicles, especially uh, with our military um, departments, is something that is a top priority. Um, but I'll also take that request back uh, as well. Thank you so very much. Thank you for allowing me the time to discuss this. Absolutely. <clears throat> Thank you very much, Chair Kaptur. We're always happy to hear more about the Great Lakes. And uh, Administrator Reagan, you weren't just double teamed. This is like a force of nature here. Uh, so keep the Great Lakes in your focus. And since I grew up in Minnesota on Lake Superior, I'm, I'm a strong supporter of anything uh, and all Great Lakes, even though I'm devoted to the ocean these days. But um, thank you so much for your Good thing uh, Chair McCollum wasn't here, too. It really got him. <laughs> I know. You, you, this, this, this committee is heavily weighted to the Great Lakes. So uh, the, the real power rests there. So we, we just struggled to get a little attention to the ocean on the east and west coast and the south as well. Well, we're very appreciative of your time today and uh, your thoughtful answers to all of our questions. And of course, we look forward to working with you in this budget process. And I think I speak for myself and the ranking member. I don't know if you want to make any other remarks, but um, we're just happy to have had you here today. I just thank you for your time. I, I know I missed you when you're here. As uh, everybody on the committee knows, I've been recuperating, but now I, five weeks later, I have a new knee. So, you know, there's no stopping me now. I'll follow you wherever you need to go. <laughs> well, I tell you, uh, I, you know, I hate that we couldn't time it in a way that you could participate. So that just means I have to come back and visit you. I'm, I'm committed to visiting the districts and spending time because I believe that that's where the solutions come from. Great. Great. Lots to show you. <laughs> Well, thank Absolutely. you very much. Thank you to the committee. If there are no other questions, this uh, meeting stands adjourned. Thank you all.